Hello and welcome to the Double Your Freelancing Podcast, where you'll learn how to raise your rates, get better clients, and just generally have a way better life as a freelancer or agency owner. I'm your host, Zach Swinehart, and today I am talking to Bo Peter Lonen, who is a marketing coach for online course creators. Today's episode is all about AI. Bo is going to talk to us about how he uses AI for content production and marketing, as well as for streaming, streamlining his workflow and leveraging it to increase lead flow and build a personal brand. This was recorded originally in our private uh, accelerator community as an expert interview. So if you want to check that community out for yourself and get in on these lives that you can ask people questions, you can do that at dyf.link forward slash dyfa. The community includes weekly coaching with myself, plus the text bit and weekly goal setting. So let's dive into the interview. Bo, usually I do loads of prep for interviews and I have all these questions mapped out. But in this case, I feel like I don't even know enough to know what to ask you. So I've been leaning on you to guide this a little bit. Um, and I, I know you've been using AI for a while, so maybe we start there. You could tell me about, you said, I think that you were like one of the early adopters of ChatGPT or something. Like maybe you tell me about how you first got into AI. Before ChatGPT came out in November of last year or October or something like that, uh, there were already tools out there using OpenAI's framework, uh, you know, basically the ChatGPT models, but ChatGPT slash OpenAI did not have their own thing. So there was something called Jasper AI, uh, formerly known as uh, Conversion AI, and there's a, a plethora of, you know, content production tools using OpenAI's framework. Um, so I got in and started using that at the end of 2020, um, and started to learn how to use it and all the different, uh, you know, use cases that you could come up with it, whether it was mostly around content production, so social media and blog posts, um, and then trying to figure out how I could use that for my marketing clients. Um, and as the technology has progressed, uh, as tools like Jasper AI has progressed, um, the use cases keep getting more and more, uh, well, kind of crazy and mind blowing. Um, and in my opinion, now ChatGPT is probably the, the best tool out there, uh, since it's really coming from, from them in terms of content production, uh, but also as a thought partner, a learning accelerator, um, an organizer of your, your ideas. But I think what's really important for everybody to know is like, you have to put in, uh, your own, your own ideas, because if you just depend on the tool for ideation, uh, it, it's not going to be as powerful as you'd like it to be. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, I think that <clears throat> where I usually get limited when trying to use AI is like I I don't instruct it correctly. I'm not pleased mm. with the output, and then I say this is stupid. AI is stupid. So. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about your agency? So it's a growth marketing agency. What's uh, what's your agency called? Just so, so it's on the recording for not. Yeah, definitely. One. Thank you for for that question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think I think it is uh, a generous to, to call me uh, fully an agency right now, but I do call it Grow with Bo. You know, nice and easy there. Uh, my website is blaanen dot com. Um, but as as it stands right now, it's. I'm a team uh, of freelancers with me in the lead to find clients, and we help uh, online course creators and uh, coaches to find or you know, to to find their target audience, to find their target audience, and speak to them in a way that is, uh, yeah, Zach, your your audio is a lot lower, but yeah, <laughs> finding your target audience and speaking them to in a way that is going to. Uh, continue moving them up a, a value ladder. So, I mean, I know double your freelance rate does this as well, but like, you know, lead magnet, maybe a lower uh, price offering and then getting them up that ladder so that they become, um, you know, the high value target customer that you want them to be. Cool. And is this volume better now, by the way? Yeah, I hear you better now too. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're saying for a client of yours, like an ideal client would be a course creator who maybe they launch their course, they have some revenue, but they don't really have good email flows and stuff like that. 
And so you need to help them systematize all that stuff and do a better job. Is that the idea or what's that? Look yeah, like? the ideal client is definitely somebody who has uh, a proof of concept or well, beyond a proof of concept, I would say like good, good market fit. People are coming in, people are giving feedback on the course saying that it's working, but they want to that their course creator now wants to figure out how to scale uh, their their course offering. And typically what they'll tell me is, oh, we've never done marketing before, but mm. the reality will be is that they're already posting on LinkedIn or YouTube or wherever their target target audience is and generating uh, a reasonable amount of traffic and and getting you know well known in their their niche. And I've done everything from how to build a chatbot courses to drumming courses to photography courses to career acceleration um, coaches and and the like. Um, so yeah, typically they already got, I don't know, anywhere from 20 to 30,000 in revenue per month. And now they want to scale that to like a hundred K or more. Cool. And I know that one of the things that are working on with you in the community is the whole productizing service offerings thing, getting out of the hourly sort of stuff. So some of these questions that I want to ask you, I understand might not be so relevant for you right now, but what I'm thinking about is like, even though you don't have a productized service offering, I imagine you have some consistent threads that you do for pretty much every client. What are those? Like the technical deliverables you do for pretty much every client right now? Or what's a, maybe a better one is, what's a typical client's uh, technical requirements for you right now? Yeah, it, it really depends on where they are at their business. And this has probably been my struggle in terms of productizing my services is that I offer, I do too much, right? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning I can help a client run their digital ads on Facebook, on Google, on LinkedIn, uh, what have you. I can help them with their marketing automation. I can help them with their landing pages, um, their, their email flows from uh, getting people from A to B. Um, and going through that entire qualification process, especially if they have a really big lead flow is figuring out which are the leads that we actually need to focus on and get them going and where are they in their journey. Um, where, and one last item, which I think is definitely my path forward in terms of productizing uh, is, is around uh, search engine optimization. So both on the technical side, helping people figure out, hey, what's going on with my website? Why is it not um, getting as much traffic as they possibly could? And on the other side of the actual content production um, and getting uh, yeah, developing new content for them, getting it onto their website and doing it in a way that it's totally keyword optimized so that uh, folks are, uh, yeah, finding their website and, and getting a lot more uh, traffic uh, that, that totally matches what that my customer actually needs. Okay. So, yeah. So, so what I'm trying to form in my head, because <clears throat> this is an AI interview after all. So I yes. want to form in my head the picture of a typical client. And then I want to hear where you'd use AI. So let's say, let's say mm -hmm. this for a typical client. So if, with this SEO path forward, have you done this yeah. for a client yet, or this is like something you're about to try for the first time? Oh no, this is the stuff that I'm work that I'm uh, doing, and I was just checking out on one of my clients and noticed that we had grown their search traffic uh, 12x, their weekly search traffic, uh, just in the last six months. So from like just around a couple hundred to now, uh, yeah, uh, about a about a thousand, uh, no, 7,000 in the last month. I have to like wow. do math on that again. But yeah, that's, that's going really well. Um, and the keyword research, like the entire SEO process, I have steps where I am using AI for that. So, um, for example, with artificial, uh, let, let's say uh, I have a customer who is, is in the hot tub space, right? And uh, this is obviously not a course creator, but uh, it is one of my clients. And I can go to a tool like Ahrefs, which is the second biggest uh, crawler on the internet, getting familiar with all of the Google search. Um, and it is, you know, figuring out which keywords uh, are ranking for which pages or which pages are ranking for which keywords. Um, I can download all of that, those keywords that are relevant to the hot tub category, run them through an AI tool, and it will then again run through the internet and find which of these keywords are coming together 
um, and should be represented on one page. So then instead of going and trying to rank for just one keyword, you're trying to rank for a cluster of keywords that um, is going to generate a lot more traffic uh, for that one particular blog. Um, and that's just the, the keyword research phase. Then it's content uh, outlining, content writing, um, and that always takes uh, needs to be done in hand in combination with a writer and AI, and you can get fantastic results, generate um, content fairly quickly, and then also use AI for editing and making sure that you've got all the keywords in the right place so that you can really have a uh, high traffic acquisition blog piece. Wow. So I feel like I could unpack everything you just said into like three hours of interview. So I'll try to ask just a few of the, the high levels because I'm personally quite interested in SEO since it's, it's you know, I've been doing web design for <clears throat> over a decade and I've never, yeah. I've never really understood SEO. It always has kind of seemed like dark voodoo magic to me a little bit. And I've been thinking a lot about SEO, especially as it stacks up to AI and all of the content that AI is going to be writing. So mm -hmm. here's a question for you, a hot take. Do you know um do you know Dan Norris of WP Curve? Do you know that guy? I I'm not aware of him, no. Okay. Well, he's this dude who a while back started this subscription service where you pay a monthly fee and you get unlimited updates to your WordPress website. And he sold okay. that business and he started some other businesses and he's going kind of back into that business with a very AI forward take. And he did he sent an email newsletter the other day where he in one day turned around 20 blog posts. And as a content creator, my objection whenever I've tried to use AI for content writing is like, and I, this is what I want your hot take on. I feel like perhaps one might argue that with AI essentially curating information that it already found on the web, mm -hmm. if we carry all this forward, there will be more of a need for like an individual voice or an individual perspective, not based on everything that could exist, but just based on experiences. And whenever I yep. try to use an AI thing, like I feel like I'm just creating some listicle that's already existed and then I don't like the pros of it. And I maybe it's just me feeling like a special snowflake and I need to get past this and get with the times, or maybe there's validity to it. Or maybe, maybe the takeaway is like what you're talking about is almost two routes like maybe there's a strategic seo content mm -hmm. versus a thought leadership content but then again it's all going on the same site so how do you reconcile it so yeah what do you think of this whole this whole thought train yeah what you are bringing up is probably the biggest objection to content creation with artificial intelligence is that it sounds so bland or so generic or hey anybody could have written this right and that's where you definitely need to find ways to insert your own voice. Um, and, and I see a question com coming in from Kim about is, is focusing on SEO and search traffic still relevant right now with so many AI content generation? And I think that actually comes very much the same to this question from Zach, which is uh, how does my con how do you make content that doesn't sound generic, that doesn't sound like somebody else, that anybody could have written it, right? And my answer to that is to stay relevant in the SEO age. If you want and write high converting content or high a traffic acquisition content is that you still need to bring to this content your own personal experience. And why I say that is that your unique perspective and your unique uh, experience with a particular topic is going to make that content piece that much more interesting, especially if you have some unique piece of information or relevant info that you can inject into that the topic of the content and I uh, say something new and don't just say something new for the sake of it, but value add, right? Because if you're not adding value in the, in the new SEO age, you're not going to, uh, like Google is going to figure out if people are coming to your website, enjoying what you wrote and then using that information, or if you're just clicking back to the search results and going to the next thing, right? Um, so when everybody starts to write very generic articles for any number of search terms, the way to stand out then is to cr provide new statistical information. That's definitely one way. Like for example, the other day I wanted to know uh, what's the average amount of emails that someone can get before they kind of go cuckoo, right? 
uh, and or handle. And literally every article online quoted the exact same statistic. It was like 40 emails per day. I'm like, okay, but why do we all think this? And I could not actually find <laughs> the original statistic for that. Everyone's just quoting each other, right? Yeah. And that's the kind of SEO garbage that's not going to get us very far. So if someone had taken that you know, question that I had and really turned it into uh, a good, a better answer, then that was going to be the article I would maybe share with other people or something like that. Mm. Um, and ChatGPC now has the ability to use Bing search uh, to find you answers. And my experience with that so far is that uh, ChatGPT is very limited in the answers that it can give based on the search results. So if there's you know, a lot of cruddy information out there or even conflicting information, that's the output that you're going to get. Um, so that, yeah, that still, uh, means that we as content creators in the SEO have to put really good information out there or better information than what the competitors have, because chat GPT is going to be looking at that information and then passing it on to other people and still have the source to your site. So you mm -hmm. might not get as much traffic anymore. That's potentially what we're looking for in the future, but because if someone's really, really interested in the content that you are creating, they will go to your site and they will still engage with you and, you know, take that next step into your funnel. Um, I want to take that back to your question, Zach, unless you want to quickly insert and ask something. I will tell you what I'm going to ask next, because maybe it'll inform your answers. So, because <clears throat> I'm reflecting on my own process as you're talking. <clears throat> and I feel like my usual process for like creating a new blog article or something is mm -hmm. if someone in the community or someone broadly is asking the same sort of question and we don't have an article on the site yet, I say, okay, this needs an article. So then yeah. I go into Notion, I plan out how I want that article to flow. And then I either write it or try to get an AI to write it. And I think yep. I th this is where I always struggle because I sometimes feel like I'm tinkering with the AI for as much time as it would just take to write the thing. What I'm thinking is kind of interesting from what you're saying is that maybe it's the, the the flow that I'm taking, this like human snowflake flow, it's kind of fundamentally different perhaps than this SEO flow. Because this SEO flow, you're not saying, Zach, use your snowflake brain to think of your snowflake content. You're saying, use data to inform what keywords to target, to inform what article to write, have the AI write the thing, layer your snowflake on top at the end. So it's like, it's almost like flip flops. So yes, please do answer the question and then know mm -hmm. that I'm about to ask you a question about this and perhaps they'll merge into one answer. Yeah, so uh, big the big takeaway, I think, from your original question is like, how do I make content not sound bland? And that is, if especially if you're going to consistently be writing content, is you should first define what is your tone of voice? What is your style of writing? What are the key messages that you would want any blog on your website to include? Um, and even what would be your call to action on that blog, right? Um, if there's anything around positioning, and this kind of goes back to key messages, is like, what is the key messages that you want your brand to put out there, right? And if you have that already, then this is what's going to help your um, content be not so bland, not so vanilla. You could also add instructions like right from my first person perspective as Zach from wfreelance.com uh, and, um, you know, know that I help, like who is my target audience? So you could also add that who the target audience is. Right. And so now instead of saying to chat GBT, something along the lines of, um, the first thing you always say is pretend you are or assume that you are uh, this type of person, this type of copywriter, this type of blog writer, right? So you have to give ChatGPT a role. So say, pretend you are an expert copywriter, right? Now, ChatGPT is not going to give you a generic answer based off of a conversational piece, but gets into the mindset of basically, I'm writing content for you, like SEO content or blog content or something like that, right? Then you can give it the, the topic that you want to write about. So create an outline, or perhaps you give an outline, and then uh, it starts to fill in the blanks for you, right? And then under that, you give all that s secondary information, such as brand the brand voice info. So that is how you can keep your, your content and or take your content 
uh, from ChatGPT and make it very, very specific to you, right? Mm. So now instead of just writing, uh, answering the question that you wanted to write about, it'll say like, oh, like over here at W Freelance Rate, uh, you know, this is what we believe in and yada, 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 like whatever it is that they, uh, you, how you want it to, to write from. Uh, so that tone of voice, positioning statement, this type of stuff is going to make your content stand out a lot more and make it more like feel like it's coming from you. Mm. If I asked you, and it's okay if it's the secret sauce, tell me if you don't want to give it away. Do you have an example prompt that you've used for having an AI help write some content for one of your client sites that you would want to share? Or does that give away your whole like competitive advantage? Because <laughs> ultimately AI does come down to the prompt. So I don't want to force you to give something away if you don't want to. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I kind of just give like the high level overview of it. Right. So, um, it can, yeah, I'm happy to, to put something into the chat here, but it's going to be something along the lines of like, pretend you are a converse or a expert blog writer. I always like to put expert in there. It somehow assumes a better <laughs> style, right? I uh, pretend you are an expert blog writer who is helping me write a blog about topic, you know, put, you know, put that into brackets for what it's worth. Uh, my target audience is freelancers who want to double their current billable rate and, um, you know, write from my first person perspective, you, uh, say I use, uh, Zach mentioned double your freelancing.com, you know, say that some of our key takeaways are always about value-based pricing, uh, use a tone of voice that is uh, informative, kind, but still authoritative, right? So you can definitely use multiple adjectives to describe yourself. Um, and again, put in some of those key messages, like I just said, like the value-based pricing. So I think to come back to you, like what's the, the prompts is that everybody gets hung up on what the prompt should be and you should learn to be able to create prompts by yourself. Um, and a really good tool for that, uh, that I've, uh, learn and I'll just drop it in the chat. There's a, a Chrome extension called AIPRM. Um, and though I don't always uh, have it on, what it will do is uh, when you open up ChatGPT, will uh, provide you a list of prompts that other users have created. And they try to kind of guard the secret sauce and like they won't show you what the prompt actually is and they'll just yeah. ask you for your input. But then as soon as you like recycle that, I mean, recycle, refresh the chat, it, you can see the prompt. So oh, that's right. where I've learned okay. a lot of the, uh, like pretend you're a copywriter, pretend like, et cetera, because this is what gets really good output. And then you can learn mm. how different people are using different prompts for their use cases. And then you can start to iterate and build. Um, but the biggest thing is, always make it specific to what you need and how you want it to. Uh, so yeah, the role, the context, brand voice, this type of thing, uh, that's going to make a big difference. Cool. So I'm, I'm trying to layer this over some of my clients over the years. Like I have, um, one client who I do launch copy for, who's very, very, very particular about like, she's happy for me to do con copywriting for her like launches. But she would mm -hmm. not be so happy for me to, me or anyone else to do content writing. Like, I think she's probably an outlier, but she plans to like poach someone from the New York Times when she wants a content writer. Whereas most businesses mm -hmm. see content writing as an afterthought. And I think it does vary based on industry. Like your hot tub client, I'm sure they don't really care that much about their brand voice. But a course creator client with a personal brand, I imagine cares mm -hmm. a lot. So I'm curious who your pickiest client is about brand voice with the longest history of like an existing blog who you are now doing mm. blog content writing for and what what the process has been like for you creating stuff that they're happy with because i think for most content creators our content it's like very it's our baby we don't want to just put out shit. uh so I'm, yeah. I'm sure you've gone through this with the client so what what experiences have you had there and what have you done yeah I mean, I will say, Zach, this is definitely going really far out of um, artificial intelligence, kind of. I mean, I, I see they, they kind of come together, but this is when it comes down to something that um, 
a s well a hiring platform that i know they are used they call it uh knowledge transfer which is you have to really like create like this big questionnaire for the client and get everything about how they think etc get their brand positioning out of them so that you can use it for the way that you write content um when it comes to really really like specific type of content for example when i was working with the company who was doing uh chatbot design and courses around that it was incredibly challenging to write content for them because they have a very expert oriented way of thinking about this stuff and mm-hmm. i am not that expert and to get that out of them was a challenge so for the blogs that i had to write i basically had to do an interview with them to understand what it is that was their uh, frame of reference for this particular topic and then turn that into something that was relevant. Mm. Um, this is actually where you can then start to use AI is you can feed the transcripts from such a call and start to pull out all of the key takeaways that, um, me sometimes being tired or whatever is not going to do as well when I am looking at a transcript, right? It's, you know, looking at an hour worth of conversation, um, that's very, dense is um uh it takes brain resources and yeah. by being able to input that into a tool like chat gbt and say hey you know what are the key takeaways um how do i build this up it, it's super helpful to have that partner um but yeah then you have to at that point you're going to ping pong back and forth once you have a, a blog written with the client to make sure that they actually really like it and if this is something that uh they're really hung up on um my, what I do try to share with clients though, is that if you want your blog to start ranking for traffic, we need to produce at least one blog per week. And if we're gonna get hung up, if this is gonna take more right. time for you, uh, then, uh, then it is productive, then we're never going to help you grow your blog. Right? Yeah. We, we need to be able to produce and, um a lot of seos out there will say like you need to produce the content and then once you see what is ranking uh that's when you should really go back and say okay how can i really knock this piece out of the park Mm. uh because otherwise you're investing way too much time and resources to make something reasonable Um, that makes sense yeah yeah like small bets and then make the good the one that's working real good yeah exactly so um yeah go ahead yeah yeah, I wanted to uh, go back to what you asked earlier, or you had mentioned earlier about how to think about SEO and content production. And um, you had mentioned like, hey, someone asked this question. Uh, that's something I'd like to write about. You know, this is definitely a very uh, value-based approach to writing blog content. Um, and what I mean by that is that people who have that question, if you are answering it the best, they are going to be most convinced by you. Definitely. Um, and that is, um, and that's great. But if you want to, and that's like writing for conversion, right? If you want to write for uh, traffic acquisition, like get more people who are relevant to your your niche, your target audience, then focusing on the grouping of keywords that has the most search volume first and then going down the list mm. is what's going to help you generate the most traffic. Um, so there's always a balance there. Like what type of content do you want to focus on? Because if you focus only on high volume content, then you might not have enough bottom of the funnel type of content that are actually going to convert people into paying customers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, um, I have this one client who runs a financial blog and I'm sure he's now using AI for a lot of writing because his, he used to be like special snowflake guru style. And now it's like, Mint versus YNAB, top 10 tips for budgeting, like the kinds of things the AI would be really good for. And Mm -hmm. I remember him doing some digging into like, like I was just showing them him the Ahrefs for W Freelancing and he was saying how like, oh, a lot of these are really low traffic keywords. And what you're saying makes Mm -hmm. me reflect that if I invest for probably, I think it's usually like three to five hours to conceptualize, plan, write, edit, publish a blog post. Mm-hmm. And that's on something that doesn't have volume or doesn't have this systematic approach that you're describing. It's it's five hours invested into something that no one's going to read versus kind of this shotgun approach and honing what's resonating. It's interesting. But I'm I'm catching myself here because I'm asking you about what I'm interested in 
uh, but that's different. This, this is the wrong scope. So I think what I'll have to do is one day if you're down and Kim is here, so she mm -hmm. saw me working her into tacit permission for like 50 future interviews. If you're down, <laughs> what I'll do is we'll have you on sometime to talk about AI and SEO and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. cause I think that this is like its own topic. And then for today, I'm going to wrangle myself back because this is all out of scope. So one question I have for you, cause again, this interview is like AI for running an agency and all this SEO mm -hmm. stuff is really cool, but maybe someone here who's like, well, I'm just doing web design agency. I want to know how this is relevant to me. That's where mm -hmm. I need to reroute. So a question I have just off the top of my head for you, I know that uh, right now you're working on raising your rates, increasing client quality. And I think you're, as I recall, having some challenges with scale based on what you're paying it versus what you're charging, that kind of thing. So I'm just curious before we dive into everything else, if you were to use AI to grow your own agency, and you probably already are, or maybe you're the shoemaker with the crappy shoes or whatever, uh, what do you think the way that would move the needle the most with your own agency would be? Like, how, how would you leverage AI to to move the needle with your own agency with your problems? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think based on what we've talked about before, my biggest things are going to be go moving to value-based pricing and, and finding those clients, right? So, um, how I am going to be using, uh, chat GPT, for example, for that are, um, well, a couple of things I'm starting with taking some of these time consuming tasks that are uh, challenging for me, or at least that I want to do less of and finding out ways to use chat GPT for them. So um, for example, some of the use cases like Zapier, the if this, then that tool action and a trigger. Um, I've now been figuring out all sorts of ways to take things that are important to my business or help me do my business more effectively and automating them. So some easy examples are Let's say I get a client uh, email and they have a request for a new project or task. Uh, and this is how I interact with some of my clients. Um, then I need to turn that into a to-do list uh, and tasks into my project management tool. But this takes time. And sometimes when I get that email, I'm not in like the frame of reference to do that. So I now can forward that email to a specific email address I've made, which triggers Zapier to uh, take the email, give it to ChatGPT to read, and then basically create summary with key action items mm. that the client has requested, and then also infer what else should be done to make that a successful uh, deliverable, mm. and then put that into the project management tool. So that way, I can just forward that email and then come back to my project management tool and say, oh, I have a new task that needs to be done now. And of course, I can adjust the task, et cetera. But this already takes 80% of that thinking that I had to do and reduce it tremendously. Right. And now I can use that for everything. And so um, I was just going to ask, how are you inserting like chat GPT or whatever into that Zapier flow? So Zapier has built out, or I don't know, OpenAI has built out a action oh, for really? cool. uh, chat GPT. So um, there's still some limitations in terms of like how much output it can create, but, um, basically all you need is, uh, open AI. If you've got a chat GPT account already, if you go to your open AI, AI version, you can get an API key and then use that in Zapier. Um, and, um, they also have the, uh, open AI actions. So. Uh, which is different from ChatGPT because you could also ask Zapier to create an image for you or um, mm. take audio and turn it into a transcript. Uh, that is also now possible uh, with Zapier. Um, and there are definitely, especially if you have a little bit more uh, coding knowledge into your uh, experience, you could also get Zapier to do some coding stuff with, uh, yeah, with any triggers and open AI. So wow. that's that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's built in now. And so this is great by the way. And I tell me if I'm putting you on the spot too much, cause I don't want you to feel like I'm interrogating you, but, um, no, not at all. This is fun. Yeah. This is super <laughs> densely packed. So I'm curious, like, let's say you wanted to five X your lead flow and you wanted mm. to employ some of the strategies you use for your clients 
for yourself. In your case, you already have a niche chosen. You already know you serve course creators. What would you right. do? Would it just be SEO for yourself? Or like, what would you do if you wanted to go 5X your lead flow tomorrow? Well, start 5Xing your lead flow tomorrow. Yeah, um, the things that I'm working on right now are creating a SEO process where um, instead of giving topics to my team to write about, which is what I was doing and still kind of getting this generic and bland content is being much more involved in the content production process myself, where I can provide that unique perspective and experience that I have so that we're really generating better blog pieces that are more likely to get shared and uh, et cetera. Um, so generate more traffic. And this is definitely a long game. Uh, but then also turning that into building my personal brand on LinkedIn. And I've been just doing that for two weeks now, more regularly posting. And again, still trying to figure out how we can make the content truly be valuable. So definitely some experimentation there. Um, but, you know, slowly we're starting to see more and more uh, profile views uh, and getting more traffic to my website from LinkedIn as well. So my big next step is to actually finally creating that blueprint style lead magnet for those online course creators and turning that into uh, yeah something that's going to help me collect leads. And I'm starting to think more and more, I obviously need to do something around ChatGPT and AI because I love talking about it and I do experiment uh, with it all the time. Um, so that's going to be the, the first part is creating that lead magnet, promoting it with SEO, taking the uh, blog content pieces that I have and turning them into uh, LinkedIn posts of different styles and formats, and then just building the traffic that way. So SEO and LinkedIn are definitely going to be my two biggest. Um, and I think that for online course creators um, and, and anybody who is in the knowledge information space, that this is uh, long-term the most sustainable approach versus relying on advertising. Um, because as soon as you stop advertising, you don't get that traffic anymore, right? And so with uh, SEO especially, you're going to keep generating traffic. And with LinkedIn, if you just stay consistent, you will, um, you know, that snowball will continue to grow and you'll get more and more people interacting with you, engaging with you, following you uh, and, and all of that stuff. Um, and yeah, I had a client who has been doing that LinkedIn stuff for a while now and now has 30,000 followers and gets almost all of his best clients that way. Cool. So your client who has had that result, what is their their industry? Or like, because you said they get clients, not customers, right? So what are they doing? Mm -hmm. um, coaching. So yeah, career coaching. And um, they have like a, you know, t six month program in which they help people get their next job or the next promotion or whatever it is that they're looking for. Um, so, and that's a high ticket sale, you know, we're talking about, uh, many thousands of dollars and, uh, that's where building that personal brand, I think truly matters because you need to get people to be comfortable with you to see that you're authoritative, that you've got, um, the knowledge in the background to be able to deliver the result that you are promising. So what does your your LinkedIn strategy, like I'm just trying to think if someone's listening and they're like, ah, oh, this sounds cool. I'd like to do some LinkedIn mm -hmm. marketing, build my personal brand. Uh, what does that process look like? Are you like writing miniature? Because I, I know Kim does some LinkedIn marketing and it sounds almost like she writes like miniature blog posts. Like what is mm -hmm. your, what's your process for? Like if someone's listening, they want to do this, what's the loose process of what you're doing? My process is around uh, yeah, this can be a very long discussion, but to keep it short, I suppose, is to figure out the topics that I want to talk about and um, have a strong opinion on or are authority builders. And what I need to transition to is more authority building. So showing case studies, showing the results that we're getting, and then as well as lead builders. So uh, posts that are going to get people to my profile and then click through to get the lead magnet or whatnot. So when I have that lead magnet in place, we're going to do a lot more of that type of stuff. Um, and then figuring out ways to deliver that. Um, and by ways, what I mean is different structures. There's going to be all sorts of different uh, ways to structure a LinkedIn post. And there are a host of LinkedIn content creators that I can point to who have really good examples. 
Um, but to take this back to artificial intelligence is what anybody in the, if you're producing content and whether for yourself or for your clients, what I would start doing is get into the habit of saving um, really great copy and content that you see out there, whether it's a LinkedIn post or a blog article or, well, not so much blog articles, but like landing pages, sales pages, registration pages. If you see something out there and then you think, hey, that's really, really good. Or even better, if you see that it's producing really well for your the results that you need for your client or for your registration page, use that now as a structure. Um, and you can actually just feed that entire page to ChatGPT and say, rewrite this for me for this target audience, mm. for this purpose, with this tone of voice. And basically say, yeah, take take the same structure and format, but rewrite the content for my purposes. And it, it can do that entirely. And then of course you got to edit, but now you, especially if you have a landing page that's working well for you in one place, you can now e much more easily rewrite that in a, in some way, uh, for, for your own purposes. Um, so yeah, LinkedIn, um, it's just like you're the probably the way that you're producing your blogs right now is very much the same way that I will have to produce LinkedIn posts, which is what is my audience interest in, in learning about or talking about? And then how do I tie that back into my business? Interesting. And I'm trying to think like, so the objection that I often have, and I think it's just because I'm bad at writing prompts, uh, is mm -hmm. that like when I do, when I write the thing and I, try to explain my tone of voice it's attempt at it like it just it feels like it would be an entire rewrite but to your point you save a little mm -hmm. bit of the mental energy of like planning the post or whatever so you were saying that with your team's content writing you're gonna get like mm -hmm. a little bit more involved in the process i'm just kind of curious what your flow looks like of where you use the ai would it be so let's say with your linkedin marketing uh, or yep. with some blog posts on your site, like you're going to come up with the concept, you'll have it do the main writing, and then you're going to come back, do the editing, and then inject your take and then have it edit again. Or what's what's that like whole flow kind of look like? Yeah, no, the uh, so a process that I'm experimenting with right now is uh, my uh, team that I'm working with, or there's one particular person I'm working with right now on the LinkedIn post is that she is looking at the comments that people are leaving on my posts, look at what uh, questions are coming up and kind of like making that list of content topics. Now, instead of her trying to first do a first pass on writing that, she'll prompt me and basically say, hey, you know, what is it about this uh, that you have something to say or talk about? And so now what I'll do instead of um, trying to write it out, because I do find that more challenging than having a conversation, is I'll hop on a a uh, tool called Descript, which basically is a transcription tool. It's very much like Loom in that you can make screen recorders, but does a great job at the transcription aspect. And I'll just start to talk about the topic uh, or the question that we have and try to answer it as best as possible. Um, so I make that recording. I grab the transcripts. I give the transcript to ChatGPT and I say now um, something along the lines of summarize uh, what I've talked about and let's say it's like a to-do thing. Um, now take out, create a step-by-step -step guide based on the uh, the transcript and with detailed instructions on how to do this, right? And so now it takes my unstructured thoughts uh, or me just blabbing on about something and turn that into a step-by-step -step guide, which I can now edit and uh, turn into something cool or turn into a post or hand over to uh, the team so that they can, um, yeah, turn it into to something better. So to so bring that back to your question, no, I'm doing the, the my input, my perspective at the very beginning of the process because trying to edit content that's already created with my perspective, it, it's already way too late, right? right. So we, ha we have to start with that. I like your flow though. I, so like, I'm thinking about myself and how I create content. Like mm -hmm. my objection to writing a blog post is it just, it takes a lot of time to collect my thoughts. So I really resonate with what you're saying yeah. here. Um, so you're saying when you go into Descript, you won't like mm -hmm. plan it ahead. It'll be kind of rambly and circuitous and that's totally fine because you're just going to take that rambly transcript and summarize it. Is that basically right? Or do you try to not be rambly when you do it? 
Um, I mean, I'll have collected some of my thoughts and sometimes maybe I'll make some quick bullet points and like, okay, what are the things I absolutely can't miss? And then go and, and talk about it. Um, but so for example, one uh, question that the team had for me was like, hey, tell, tell us more about your backstory. How did you get from this job to that next job to now freelancing? And I basically talked for 10 minutes about the story. Um, and then again, put it into chat GPT, the transcript, and it summarized it and turned it into a story for me. That was way better than anything I could write. Like I was like, wow, that's a cool story. It's my story, but it's not something I could write for myself. Right. So that was really cool. Um, but for other things like, um, because I'm experimenting with these chat GPT processes all the time, I now, uh, and I want my team to get to know them as well. I will make a screen recording of me going through a process, you know, basically like, like you're asking me how to do something. I go A to Z, show how I do it with the screen recording. And then again, take the transcript and then give it to chat GPT and say, summarize this and make, basically make the SOP for me, right? So again, instead of me having to show and show and show and show how I do a process, I can now record it once, take the transcripts, put it into ChatGPT, create the first draft of the SOP, and then edit it a bit, hand it to someone on my team and say, can you follow this process? Does it make sense? Where do you have any questions? And then from there, we can you know, improve it. But now I've got a better SOP or an, at least something there so that when either I or someone on my team needs to do that process, they can go back to it, right? Um, and then of course, from there, I could also say, hey, well, that's a process I don't mind sharing with the world. Let's turn it into any amount of social media posts. Yeah. Are the SOPs accurate? Like, I think where I always get a bit scared is that, so even frankly, I sent you a video once on Loom and remember you sent me mm -hmm. back that like chat GPT summary of the transcript of my video. It like made up a couple points. Like there were a couple of things that it said I told you that I didn't even at all tell you. <laughs> um, and so it's always kind of my concern that if I have it make an SOP, mm -hmm. it's going to like add some bullshit in or like take something important out. And then like your SOP is only as strong as its weakest mm -hmm. missed point. Uh, what's your, what are your thoughts on process there? Yeah. I mean, this is why I said earlier when describing this process is once you get the output, you need to edit it and make it better and then get feedback on it. Right. Because you should no, no one should ever take the content that's produced by AI and without checking it at all for accuracy or um, for how how the structure is, and then put it out there because that's a a, a path to looking um, like yeah to to produce content that that's not going to be as productive. Um, so yeah, you you do have to check it um, and you know, it will make, I don't want to say it makes things up, but it will sometimes take a, a leap and um, yeah, I, I guess making it up, right? But what is OpenAI really? It is a tool that predicts the next word that yeah. should be used in a certain context. So that's what it's doing. So for an, an SOP, you'd maybe, like, I'm just trying to think how I should reframe it in my mind. So I guess it's like, it's saving you the time of initially writing it, but that once... Mm -hmm it summarizes your screen recording into an SOP, you would glance at it and see if anything sticks out at you before you pass it off to your team, basically. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still going to take the output and put it into a, a Google Doc and then you know format it in a certain way. So there's still definitely a hard ed editing pass, but um, I think before I had to uh, either go through the process and then like while I was doing it, like write down each step that I was taking, and this is for me a much more natural way where I can screen record, um, turn that into an SOP, and now I can provide the written how-to as well as a video of me doing that to the team so that they can follow along with the, the SOP and see me doing mm. the, the task itself. Yeah, this is, it's interesting. I'm reflecting on how maybe there are idiosyncratic things that I have like a Zach that don't apply to others like for me, the idea of doing my screen recording, getting the video transcripted, mm -hmm. like all of these little steps, they require waiting because the transcript currently with AI takes a long time to generate. 
And so then if it were to transcribe this, summarize it, make the SOP, then now I've like I've moved on, I'm doing some other task, and now I need a context switch back into honing this SOP and mm-hmm. publishing it like to me by then I would have maybe kind of forgotten some of the things I said in the recording because I have a terrible memory, or maybe the content mm-hmm. switching cost would be high. But it sounds like for for you, you don't have that energetic cost that I might have or something. And so the bouncing doesn't bother you, or maybe my workflow is not very good. Yeah, it depends on the tool that you use because Descript does it in like 10 seconds. So I'm not mm. using like, I'm not losing a lot of time between okay, nice. me making the video and then taking it. Um, and what I like about Descript is that when I make a recording, it removes all of the uhs and ums and stuff yeah. like that automatically. So I sound a lot smarter. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't have, I, I understand what you're saying. Like the context switching aspect can be, uh, can be draining, but I, yeah, I don't have that going on right now. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm able to, to move quickly with this. Cool. Yeah. And I guess maybe that's my flaw with the, um, the otter step because otter takes longer to mm-hmm. process than descript. Right. I'm just looking through the things that you had down. So, cause I know I've steered this into all sorts of random directions and I'm looking at what you have down. Like, I guess if I were to just pause and ask you. Mm-hmm. In terms of the the ways that you use AI in your agency that you think would be most impactful for any other freelancer agency listening that we haven't talked about yet, are there any you think are like really high impact that you want to be sure we talk about? Yeah, so I think the market research aspect has been one of the biggest game changers for me, and I uh, uh, in in accelerating the pace at which I can learn, um, or at least. You know, if I have a question about something, be able to find information more quickly and then implement that into the work that I'm doing. So I think one of the things that I had shared with you is that in terms of the W Freelance Rate community, what you guys, um, I think in both courses that you have right now are uh, asking freelancers to do is to go through all of those emails that they've gotten from clients and sort of get, you know, what are the most frequently asked tasks that you get from clients and then turn that into, you know, a potential service offering. Right. Um, and obviously, you know, that can be time consuming, um, and maybe, uh, you miss some things. So what I could do is take all of those emails and either put them in a a spreadsheet where I've got them as rows, um, or just make one big document and then push them into chat GPT and again, ask, Hey, you know, uh, these are, these are client emails that I've received. What questions are they asking of me? What tasks are they requesting that I do? And, um, how, like, what is the actual language that they're using from those emails, uh, so that I get their frame of reference when they're talking about this stuff. Um, and that way I can, you know, get all of these tasks basically and get a much like much quick, much more quickly get an idea of everything that is being asked of me. Um, but you know, that's just one example. You don't have to stop there. Uh, right. Because that's just a W freelance rate example. If you have, let's say I'm onboarding a client and we need to figure out the language that their potential customers are using. If they already have lots of customer re- reviews, like let's say on Google or Trustpilot or something like that, I can go scrape all of those reviews. Um, uh, one way or another, there's always some way to do it easily. Uh, and again, put them into a spreadsheet, grab my open AI API key, use a Chrome, um, a Google spreadsheets extension that allows you to use ChatGPT in the spreadsheet and ask basically, okay, what is the sentiment of this customer re- review? What are the pros? What are the cons? What are their objections? What desires did they have um, for using this tool or course or what have you. And again, now I can uh, start to count how often are these things being said? What are the pain points? What are the desires? What are the objections? How often are these things coming up? And, you know, I can basically do customer research at a clip that when I was doing this manually two years ago, my process for market research, now I can do, you know, take a process that would take me many, many hours and now do it in like 30 minutes or something like that. Um, And then once you have that information, you can start to use, again, like build the key messaging and brand voice that I was talking about earlier and use that information to produce content 
landing pages, blog posts, social media posts that are literally using the language from your client, from your target audience, and um, and turning that into to new content. Um, another use case here would be, let's say you don't have customer reviews, find Reddit discussions about this, uh, about the topic or whatever problem you're trying to solve, and then go analyze that. And you, YouTube comments, uh, Amazon reviews, uh, you know, there's all sorts of places where your target audience is talking about this, that, you know, is a source uh, for you to go to and use ChatGPT to analyze and learn more about your target audience without ever having to talk to them. Of course, you should always go validate that information. But, um, you know, you can do that more quickly now uh, by using tools like ChatGPT. Yeah, that's awesome. That's gold right there. Yeah, I'm thinking yes. about. Yeah, and yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, it's a process that I use all the time. I mean, for, I have a client who has, I'm not going to name them or what they do, but they have very specific views on how they, uh, on what they're doing. And they put a lot of YouTube videos out, which is great, but they don't then turn that into something that we can use. So now mm -hmm. I can take that YouTube video transcript and learn how to talk about their content in a really useful way that I can, you know, then really go and start to use. Um, and then that, that just makes everything better for everybody involved. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, and I'm, you know, curious to hear your perspective on this as well as like, as I'm able to do things faster, it makes the hourly model, uh, yeah. m you know, not work for me because yeah. I can do my work very effectively, but, um, and I'm delivering way more value than I used to, but I'm not, you know, benefiting from that, so to speak. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess that's more of a statement than a question, but, uh, yeah, more, more reason to switch to value-based pricing. Yeah, I think definitely. And I think that the what I'm finding interesting in hearing you talk is the as I understand it, the main like service offering, and this is probably for a, a deeper combo or whatever, but the main service offering you have right now is tied to that like content output, like the content creation for blog posts or whatever, uh, or for mm -hmm. email marketing. But a lot of the ways in which you're leveraging AI is is not even for that content creation part, but for the all the strategic stuff that happens that enables that. And if you're just charging that monthly fee that's based on some extrapolation of human hours spent, then you're not speaking to all those other things you're doing. You're not speaking to the value of those processes and stuff. So yeah, it definitely seems like moving to a more producty model will be good. We can dive into that a little bit more later. Um, but let me think of where I wanted yeah. to go with this. Because I, I love all this market research stuff. I'm kind of curious. I know you have a niche chosen already, but a lot of people in the community are in the stage where they're trying to choose one. I'm just curious if mm -hmm. you were to choose a whole new niche, like let's say you decided you didn't want to work with course creators anymore and you were going to decide who to work with next. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on how you might leverage AI to help you make the decision of what niche to even target or what service offering to even do for whom? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I did focus on online course creators after taking the W freelance great courses because I realized that this was a recurring uh, audience, right? So if I were to say, okay, I don't want to continue working with this audience, I would go and say, okay, um, let's look at the the different clients that I have. Who uh, who else could I be uh, servicing? Um, but then, yeah, when it comes to market research. I mean, I, I think we're, I would have a challenge with not be basing this off of what I'm already doing is that I'm, I'm always looking for some input to put into chat GBT, yeah. right? And so if it's not my own emails and not my own um, experiences, then I need to get that input from somewhere else. So I would have to do maybe research on the types of problems that I can solve for people and who is basically willing to pay more for that. Um, and so maybe it could be around more niche, uh, like let's say blog post creation, like kind of back to what you're saying about not making these generic and making them very specific to its particular brand. I could try to find clients who have that problem and then be able to solve that for them. 
uh, using these tools. So I probably think of it more of like, what are the the problems that I can solve in a unique way and who is going to be willing to pay more for that? Um, because I do think that's an issue that I'm running into with course creators is that they're very much used to paying people on like this hourly uh, model and not so in like doing value-based pricing for them from their perspective is very high risk because controlling me on hours is easy. Controlling me on what I deliver is, is, is not as easy for them. Yeah. You know what could work well for you? Cause I was, I was having this conversation around value-based pricing with uh, Jordan the other day. He's, he's like well into the blueprint. He's got his podcast. He does Trojan horse interviews, does webinars. But where he's struggling mm -hmm. is that his niche is kind of like a construction-y kind of industry where they're just really, really strongly associated with like hourly estimates because that's just the norm in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so he's really struggling to do value-based pricing here just because it's like unheard of for them to to do anything but mm -hmm. hourly billing. Um, but what strikes me as a big opportunity for your thing is that when you, if you have a client and this, you know, again, we should do a deep dive so that I don't go too much into Zach the coach mode. But something that sticks out to me as an opportunity is like, you have massively increased this one client's lead flow. And the impact that that's going to have on their business is huge. And so if you wanted to go, go along on your client's success, there are probably some pricing strategies that could be very results-based that would have you like making a killing based on results that you're producing for them. Because I think if you get into the shoes of mm -hmm. like, hey, I'm going to charge you for writing content for you, that's not valuable. People are used to paying very, very low rates for content writing. But if you're saying like, hey, dude, I'm going to 5x your lead flow and I'm going to charge you based on how many new leads I'm generating, people are always going to mm -hmm. be happy to do that because they're paying you percentage of what you are creating for them. And you're going to be making way more than you're making now. I'm guessing the um, the challenge is enforcement and attribution. Like, if mm -hmm. you are doing SEO, they could say, "Well, how do I know that your thing is the one that generated the leads?" Uh, but it's also actually really easy in your case to do that because if you're doing SEO for somebody, you can track the mm -hmm. blog posts that you create for them, and the, you can just like add UTM parameters to know which subscribers joined the email list from a blog post that you wrote and now suddenly you know exactly how many new leads are on their list and how many of those leads convert to customers and thus how many new dollars you put in their pocket thanks to your seo content and you can charge them i mean if you think about it any of your mm -hmm. clients who have an affiliate program they are used to paying 50 percent commissions typically on course content so if you are charging them a 50 percent commission on any sales you generate and those sales are generated from seo like could see that being pretty cool. Uh, so it may be that that moving into value-based pricing is like that classic thing we talk in here a lot about, which is like, if you don't want to be a commodity, don't position yourself as a commodity, mm -hmm. position yourself as the impact and have your pricing perhaps reflect that. Anyway, this will give you some seeds to think about, but let's do a deep dive on your business soon and we can make a better strategy. Sounds good. So let me uh, get out of Coach Zach mode and go back to my questions. Um, but I'm also curious, I think, you you know, you had said that there would be some time for Q&A. And, &A, and mm -hmm. if there are any questions from an audience, I haven't seen any come up uh, lately, but I'd, I'd love to also find out from the, the community what what are they struggling with or what would they like be interested to use AI for if there are any questions. Um, but otherwise, we can definitely just continue to, to go down your list of questions, too. Well, I can tell you something. I don't know how you feel. Mm -hmm. Something I have down to hit you up about is... Um, like potentially doing a JV course with you in the DYF sphere where we can like literally, because today you've given a lot of high level concepts, but if I were to implement some of these in my mm -hmm. own agency, I would really struggle to implement some of them. Like I wouldn't know what to type right. in. I still would struggle with the same low quality output. So maybe there's some opportunity here for like a start to finish action plan for freelancers to incorporate AI, where you can like walk them through the prompts, through your workflows. It'll all get outdated in three months once the tooling changes, but it'll always be this for now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that would be kind of like as I'm reflecting on what we've talked about today. Like, I see how you're using it for content. I see how you're using it for collection. But I feel like what I would be lacking would be an exact 
tangible, actionable thing. Do you have any any resources if if people want to like? So if I were taking this away, my takeaway is there's a lot of opportunity mm-hmm. here, but I need to get better. Where should I learn how to get better at using AI? Um. Well, the course that we're going to create is definitely going to be the uh, the first uh, step for that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's challenging because all, a lot of the content that I see out there around ChatGPT is like everything on YouTube and whatnot. And even some of the prompts that I've purchased from other people is that they're very like limiting in the sense that you need to think of this as like a broader like workflow, right? You don't just do one prompt and that's it. Sometimes you need to have like really long conversations with ChatGPT to get the final thing that you want. Um, So getting into that mindset is something that not a lot of people are talking about right now. Um, If, you know, for people who are willing to uh, pay for these uh, resources, I would direct them to uh, the AI author community uh, by Darby Rollins, uh, John Benson, founder of the um, video sales letter, does uh, I think like a monthly webinar where he's showing people how he's using it. He doesn't show a whole lot, but I have learned some things from those free webinars. Of course, he's just trying to pitch uh, pitch the, what he's trying to work on, which totally makes sense. He's putting out great content, um, and. Um, Jasper AI also has a lot of courses on how to use their tool specifically. Um, but I think that there's something that you can still learn there from how to use it for, uh, yeah, all sorts of workflows. Okay. That's good. That's helpful. I'm looking through my notes. Hmm. So I see like <clears throat> kind of some different, different circles of use here. There's strategic, where you are making decisions. There's research aggregating. There's client work delivery. And they're kind of, they have different workflows within. I feel like the um, the research one is probably the easiest one to get like a fast and awesome ROI from. I'm curious with your Google Sheets example, is there a limit to... Um, to like content that it can process. Like I know usually if I'm in chat GPT and I have it try to work with a big block, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Does that limit apply in Google Sheets as well? Um, yeah, there are still limitations there. And I just put in the, the prompts for like the market research uh, type of thing that I sometimes use. But uh, with uh, a spreadsheet, every uh, formula, every like every row or like, what do you call that uh, cell? It, with its own formula is its own prompt. So oh. let's say I have like a hundred rows of reviews and basically I can like click and drag the a prompt like the one I just put into the chat is say, um, you know, I, I would probably modify it a little bit to make it clear that I'm just, you know, having it summarize or write down the in bullet point format, the key takeaways from one particular review and then just drag that formula down the the spreadsheet and then it would, you know, process each individual review and then from there i could say okay now grab this block of cells and make a a list of like the most recurring uh themes and and reviews that are coming back and so with that workflow would you be unable to use gpt4 or maybe it doesn't matter when you're using this chrome extension um you can use Chrome, the chat GPT for, uh, for whatever reason, it has a lot of latencies. So I tend to just use the three and a half model. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, indeed, you don't need to use the spreadsheet. Sometimes I just like to do that if I like to be a little bit more structured and I really want to know like how many times is a particular thing coming back. But let me, let me rephrase. So like GPT four mm-hmm. currently has that limit of like 30 prompts within a few hours or whatever. Uh, if, oh, if each yeah, cell like is a prompt, would you mm-hmm. run into that cap? No, uh, with the open AI, uh, when you use, sorry, when you use the API key, mm-hmm. uh, you don't have those limitations because you are paying, uh, for the tokens that you're using versus ah, okay. where with chat GPT, where they're trying to limit your usage because they don't want you to basically right. go over the $20 a month that you're spending. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That's good to know. 
So, so let's think. Let's think of what else to ask. But if anybody else has things they want to ask, you can even ask to raise your hand and Riverside will like, I can unmute you. So if you want to raise your hand and ask Bo something, uh, I'm going to take a second to think because I just, I want to think of like, let's say, I'm trying to think of like, who's the typical person in our community. I feel like the typical person is trying to write some content to appeal to the, okay, actually, I've got a great, great customer great example for you. Okay. So Bo, let's say I'm somebody who's not Zach and I have a mm -hmm. good idea of who my target customer is, a good idea of what I want to help them with. And by the way, guys, type your questions into the chat and I'll unmute you. So I want to help um, plumbers have websites that, no, that's too, that's too easy. Um, I'm just trying to think of like a typical typical client. Um, okay, yeah, let's take Kim's question while I think of mine. So Kim's saying that she's, uh, yeah, I think Kim, it's somewhere on the bottom, but I don't, it, you might have to be in the app. But Kim says she's trying to use chat, chat GPT for painstorming niche audiences. Do you do this and how? And it sounds like you use Pain? past data. Oh, yeah. So for painstorming, it's basically mm -hmm. like, it's this model in 30 by 500 where you can aggregate a bunch of things people are saying in Reddit, like you said, or in various other mm -hmm. places. So if you were, and, and you basically take all this data, you have it ingest it and say the trends or like a good example for me, we recently, for the people who didn't buy on the sale, we said like, why didn't you buy? People said a lot of things and I mm -hmm. personally went through Reddit each email and like tagged it in Notion, but it's very susceptible to like, confirmation bias. So let's say that you just had a bunch of Reddit posts open. You had all this data. Would your next mm -hmm. step, if you wanted to learn the trends about where people are feeling pain and the painful words and get like your word cloud and see what's brought up the most, what would you do with all these Reddit tabs to start to get pain words and stuff from your target audience? Yeah. Um, if I wanted to use ChatGPT for that, I would just copy and paste the particular uh, discussions or like parts of the discussions that I'm interested in. But let's say I don't want to spend all the time reading all of that stuff, like just copy the entire, as much of the text I can put into chat GPT and then ask it one of these prompts that I have uh, just put into the, to the chat and hopefully people can see that. But I would say something along the lines of for painstorming specifically is say, pretend you're a market researcher and you're using uh, Reddit posts to understand the pain points that people are having. Uh, <laughs> when I chat, I'm reading Kim's now. So pretend you're a market researcher. You want to investigate the pain points of Dutch teachers who teach at a secondary school. What are challenges from? Uh, so Kim, your prompt is, uh, you know, t asking chat GPT to come up with the pain points that somebody might have. Right. And this is, uh, an acceptable, certainly a great place for ideation to start. But the limitation of this is that you are relying on ChatGPT to basically uh, give you those pain points without, it, it's making a best guess, knowing what it knows about teachers and this particular subject, right? And then trying to come up with an answer for you, right? And so this is a good place to start because you can then take that list of, uh, pain points that it gives you, for example, and then if you, you know, agree with some of these pain points, or you can answer some of these pain points, and that is a good starting point for you. But these are not pain points that people are actively talking about, as far as you know, right? If you're just basing it off of this information, so going through the process of finding uh, places where people are discussing uh, the, their pain points. Uh, and I think for teachers, probably a really good place is Facebook groups. Um, I don't know if in the Netherlands that's, uh, or, or Dutch teachers around the world, if they are uh, using Facebook groups to talk to one another, but wherever they are meeting to have online discussions, um, right. So yeah, most of them are going to be closed Facebook groups. You would want to try to join some of them, uh, if they let you in and then, uh, tr you know, use use the the comments the discussions there like if you can um you know search in the comments and look for how and why questions and what questions etc and then try to 
grab all of those and then ask ChatGPT to process them. Then you're going to uh, be able to get a, a view of what those pain points are. I love that approach. It, it's kind of like the um, the equivalent, really, the research equivalent of like, don't just have it write an article for you and put it on your website. Like this is saying, don't just ask ChatGPT what it thinks the pain of your audience is. Use perhaps that first step to inform your own research, but then do all that mm -hmm. research all that research yourself or have a VA do it or whatever, and then have ChatGPT process that research. But you use the human element right. for selecting what you deem relevant, right? Exactly. So like, let's say I go through this process of um, collecting this information and now getting the pain points that uh, teachers have. And Kim, could you tell me what um, service that you offer for uh, these Dutch teachers? Because then we can just keep running with this example. And Zach, if you know it, that well, I don't know what she does for teachers. Fun. Okay, so it's the mm -hmm. teachers are her client. Okay, client. Okay. All right. So, what does the client do? So she's helping her Our clients with teachers with marketing a lot mm -hmm. of the time. And uh, okay, and uh, so it looks like the client does digital learning and software. Okay. So yeah. Go okay. Ahead. So, um, and one of the challenges to transition from traditional to digital forms of teaching. Okay, great. So let's say you um, do the the research and you find out that some of the pain points that people have, uh, and I know that for online teaching, um, one of the big problems was being able to see your students and also be able to share your screen. And in the US, I know at least, providing teachers with a second computer screen was a big solution around this, right? So Okay, this is probably not going to help for digital learning specifically, but let's say you have some sort of solution for these teachers, right? You find out what their pain points are, and maybe the pain point is like, how do you set up yourself for um, teaching online in a way that's productive and allows you to engage with your audience? So like, that's their pain point, and let's say you have a solution for that. Well, now you have, you've asked ChatGPT to process this, you found the pain points, you can then, once you like, uh, say this is the pain point I want to focus on. You can then say, "Hey, ChatGPT, go back through everything that I've already gave you and find the specific language that people are using around this pain point. Make a bullet list, right? Then you can say, "All right, ChatGPT, um, uh, pretend you are an expert copywriter who is um, who excels at writing lead magnet landing pages." Um, we want to solve this problem for these teachers with this type of solution. Before you ask it to write, you say, what sections or what outline do we need in a landing page to make a successful, uh, to, to optimize for conversions, right? And so it'll start to make that landing page outline based off of the pain points that you've already pulled out. And then if you agree with that, you can add, or if you don't agree with it, you kind of say, hey, uh, restructure this section, restructure that section. And once you've got an outline that you like, then you say, ChatGPT, please write this entire landing page for me um, using this tone of voice, this style of writing, and these pain points that we've discussed. And you just do that all in the same conversation. That's great. Yeah, I, I love this. I think it's um, it's really illuminating. A, a question I could have to take it further. So let's say I've got a bunch of um, a bunch of messages and help scouts. So like recently we did a free giveaway where we said, "Tell us your biggest challenge in your business, and you can maybe win a free course." Mm -hmm. So now I've got yeah. 150, 250, something like that of these. If you were to want to process all these to get useful insights, would you basically just have your assistant go through and copy and paste each of these email responses into like a Google Sheet? And then you'd process based on that to get the trends, or what would your flow be to like make some? Because if you took all this and you put it in chat, yeah. you'd be too much data. Yeah, I would put it into a spreadsheet and then uh, create a prompt that will help you get your, you know, the takeaway from that. So it could be like, uh, be a market researcher. You're going to process email responses from the specific question that you asked. Um, what is you know the 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 pain point. Sorry, what was the question that you had asked them? What the uh, biggest what struggle is was? the biggest challenge in your business right now? Right. So you would say, okay, I have email responses from freelancers who are uh, sharing what their biggest challenge in the business is. Uh, what is the the biggest challenge in their 
their business summarize or write it in bullet points. And then from there, you would get your those bullet points um, and uh, or try to get it to format it in a way that, um, no, sorry, I'm, I'm just making this up on the spot, right? So first have it process, then you would go back and maybe like tag the first five or 10 in a way that you find useful. You can then ask the spreadsheet to learn your tagging system. And what do you mean and by tagging? Would tag, like I would write my little like, notes about their pains, like a category. Yeah, you could say something like, yeah, like what's the category so or like response, scaling, getting right? clients, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Or you could even do another prompt that says something along the lines of like, what is the the big the challenge that they face in three or four words, right? Um, or that could be your tag. And then do that for the whole list and then do like a pivot table to see how often these things are coming back. Um, or you, well, you have to like create some sort of consistent system, but that's definitely uh, one way you could go about it. Um, yeah. All right. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So let me throw another one at you. I'm going to ask them. Um, this one's going to be like on behalf of Davide and Marius, since neither of them are here. So Marius has an idea of a niche he wants to help, which is like, e-commerce businesses with some potential for software solutions to their problems. And Davide is kind of similar. He has some experience working with Ed. Oh, well, Davide, I'm asking it on your behalf. So you'll have to tell me if I'm wrong. So Davide wants to start to get some more tangible progress with the blueprint. And like, he has an idea of he was going to serve because he has past clients. So he has past clients in, mm -hmm. in the ed tech area. Mm -hmm. But the the step is essentially going to be like validating that market getting in front of people in that audience and then once he has validated pains and stuff doing content creation and lead gen and so mm -hmm. for for this flow validating the pains of the market having conversations with them getting information doing lead gen and content creation i'm just trying to think of like how ai might come in at each point like so if if let's say ed tech yeah I wonder how mm -hmm. you could find the conversations because ed tech is a little bit more niche or esoteric. How you could even find the conversations to get insights from Chat GPT, Chat GPT about the pains of, and maybe that's the research phase is that the person would have to know where they could even find the pains of the audience, and mm -hmm. then and only then take those get insights from Chat GPT. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the framework is. So um uh, is the audience people in e-commerce or in, in ed tech specifically, or this one, the people using the ed tech? This one would be ed tech business owners. Okay. Yeah, that definitely does seem. I mean, I I would need to do the research, yeah, right? It's so a lot to put you on this. Reddit, for. Red, Reddit might actually be a good place. Um, I don't know where these people are congregating because it does seem like a very, very small audience, but there has to be some podcast interviews or YouTube videos where some of these founders are talking in it, probably an interview format. And one way to go about it then would be to grab the transcript of that interview and then look for some of the pain points that might be being discussed throughout that, that transcript. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be one way is to try to find it. I mean, basically just find as much information as you can. If there is a very limiting amount of information, then you will struggle a little bit, bit a bit more for sure. Um, but yeah, that's that has to be your starting point. And if you if that information is not out there, then you have to do what the blueprint says: is go have those conversations and uh, and then find out. Um, but then for the content creation stuff, once you've got the pain points, it's a, it's a lot of what we've already talked about here today, which is um, once you have those pain points is using them to create the, the type of content that you want. And I think in the blueprint, uh, you know, Brendan shows how he goes through and takes the and creates the service offering, you know, you can you know, take that process and then use it together with ChatGPT. Like say, like take the paragraph that Brendan writes. He probably wouldn't recommend this himself, but I would guess, but take that and like um, uh, rewrite it for this audience with these pain points and my solution. 
and then you can create basically your first version of, you know, your, um, your, uh, not your manifesto, but, um, the, uh, the service offering or the, um, the lead magnet. Yeah, this is, that's a great idea, frankly, like, cause that's the thing that's always hardest is if somebody's not a copywriter, getting them to make mm -hmm. these early steps, which require some copywriting skill in addition to all these other skills. So I love the idea of like the shitty MVP being just chat GPT reworking something that kind of works and then running with that a little bit. Uh, I know we're almost at time, but one question I want to ask you is like, I know Matt has been doing some, some blogging. I don't know yet a lot of, um, a lot of who he's targeting with his posts and stuff, but suppose you know your audience. So let's say you know your audience is mm -hmm. ed tech founders and suppose you know their pain points. So they struggle yeah. because their technology is really expensive to run and they don't have any insight about whatever, whatever, you know, all these things. And mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. seems like the next step for creating an effective like content SEO strategy would be decide what the things are that you want to say. So the sense that I get is that if you know the pain points, if you know the audience, mm -hmm. you as a human snowflake, you decide what it is that you want to say. And then you tell ChatGPT to write an article based on this hook of what you want to say and based on the pains and based on well, that's it, right? Or what, what's well, and the, the, and the keywords that you want to And the keywords. And you leverage ChatGPT mm -hmm. for the keyword research, which we'd have to dig into a bit more when we have more than three minutes left. Um, and then it creates it, and then you edit, and then you polish, and then you publish. That's like your whole workflow. Uh, yeah, and yeah, and making sure that it, indeed it's. I, I use a tool called Surfer AI to help me understand if my blog posts are going to compete well uh, against the existing um, search results. Is it spelled um, correctly, Surfer? Mm -hmm. It's not like. S R F R. Yeah, or something. yeah. L Surfer AI for public for content blog production. Cool. Blog creation, blog creation. Wow. Well, yeah. you thanks for being such a good sport with my like litany of questions today. <laughs> this is great. Um, where if someone is listening to this on the podcast, granted at this point you're not doing a lot of thought leadership, but maybe by the time people hear this, you will be. So if people want to like follow you and learn more about doing AI as freelancers, assuming by the time this podcast comes out that you are mm -hmm. talking about that, <laughs> basically, where can people follow you if they want to be in your sphere? Yeah, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm I have an open profile. It's uh, my name is Bo Peter Lanen, so B O hyphen P E T E R L A A N E N, or you can go to my website and find out more information about me there at B L A A N E N dot com. B Lanen, B L A A N E N dot com. Repeat it. That's right. Do you have any parting thoughts or things you want to make sure you share before the interview's over? Anything you think we missed? Um, for anybody who's interested in using ChatGPT and does have these same like objections uh, that Zach has brought up, which is I'm not getting the results that I want, I would say don't give up to easily mm. because if you can harness the power of these tools you are going to be miles ahead of some of your competition and that's going to give you a very competitive edge um pew research uh did a poll in, in march for the u.s population and said that even though 58 percent of the population had uh heard of chat gpt only 14 percent were actually using it so there is still a very big portion of the population probably worldwide uh who is not using these tools yet. Mm. And so I highly encourage you to do take the extra bit of time to learn how to use these tools so that you are going to have that competitive edge and that you are really going to be able to knock it out of the park for your clients. Cool. That's great. And that's so crazy that only 14%. It feels like everyone, but I guess it's because we're all in our little sphere where Feels the the people who are using it are uh, using it to uh, to yell to the to the universe about it, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, this is great. Thanks so much for coming on, Bo. Let's do a, a deep dive soon, and we can try to chat about creating some course on this or something. Because I feel like you've got a million more things to say about this. So, awesome. yeah. 
uh, shoot me the, the video recording of this and I can even show you the process that I would use around, you know, getting the key takeaways and some of the things yeah, and tools that. that we've talked about. Can you about record today. yourself yeah. on Loom doing that with this video? I, I could do that. Yeah. Cool. Wow. And then we could create a transcript Better. of it and a <laughs> SOP about it. Yeah. Ah. Anyway. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Bo. So, by the way, Bo, like when I hit stop, which I guess I'll hit stop. Bye, everybody. Thank you for being here. Bo, don't hang up yet. Bye, everybody. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Remember, blanen.com for people listening to the podcast. B-L-A-A-N-E-N to follow Bo. Okay. See you guys. Thanks. Thank you. What a great episode, eh? If you want to grab all of the links and summary and whatnot, you can get them on the show notes page at dyf.link forward slash episode 92. That's the word episode and the number 92. See you next time.